Hello and welcome. Early childcare uh, and education are very, very critical aspects in a child's development, particularly the first thousand days, uh, as it's called. But this issue has not really received much institutional attention, uh, and if so, only recently under the auspices of the new education policy, which looks at the age group between three to six as an important juncture. Remember that most people only talk about the 10 plus, 2 plus, 3 structure in India. Uh, where most children come into school at the age of six uh, and uh, and then onwards. But really what happens before that is critical, has been acknowledged, but very little has been done about it. There is another perspective to this, particularly uh, children of working uh, women or working mothers who are uh, disadvantaged for various reasons. And conversely, uh, the, could, the advantage could be much higher to working women in, to, in terms of productivity and output if those children receive the right uh, level of child care, particularly at that age. So, how does this work? Uh, what's the current thinking? What do we what what do we need to do more to ensure that women uh, get that ability to uh, leave their children in child care? Remember, there are laws about this. For instance, uh, there is a uh, crash law uh, in many. Uh, on which which applies to construction sites uh, in terms of creating a crash. Now, how that works on ground is something that uh, we don't know, but it, it does exist in many states of India and at least on paper provides attention. But the larger question uh, we are trying to address is what is the large thinking on this to, to institutionalize this? And finally, and most importantly, how can networks, including those of women, uh, respond to this as either uh, a structural opportunity or an entrepreneurial opportunity. So to understand this, I'm joined by uh, someone who has been speaking and researching this issue for many years, In uh, among other things. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, be joined by Mirai Chatterjee, chairperson of the SEVA Cooperative Federation and the Self-Employed Women's Association, or SEVA, based out of uh, Ahmedabad. SEVA, as many of you would know, is a national trade union of self-employed women with over 1.5 million members, and it was set up in 1972. Uh, Ms. Chatterjee uh, uh, serves also as the chairperson of the Global Informal Workers and the Policy Makers Network, or WIEGO, uh, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, and also on the boards of, sits on the boards of several organizations, including the Public Health Foundation of India, Save the Children, Pradhan, and the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. Uh, she holds a Bachelor in History and Science from Harvard University and a Master's in Health Sciences from John Hopkins. Uh, Ms. Chatterjee, thank you very much for uh, joining me. So take us through what uh, or where we are in the, our approach to our understanding and our response to child care and child care infrastructure today. Thanks very much, Govin, and greetings to you. Um, that's a very good question. I'm happy to report that our thinking on early childhood care certainly has developed significantly uh, from the time when we started working on this issue almost 50 years ago now. This issue, I must tell you, was staring us squarely in the face because we have been organizing for women of the informal economy, as I said, for almost five decades. And the first thing women said to us was, our lives are what they are, but we work and live for our children and we dream of a better future for them, like any parent, middle class or better off parents even. We all have the same dreams for our children. And that's really how we began to work on this issue. And I recall when we first brought up this issue of early childhood care, about 40 years ago with policymakers, they were somewhat puzzled and said, child care, isn't that what mothers are supposed to do and stay home and take care of their children? And then we had to explain to them that for poor working women, it's not a choice. They have to work and then they have to also take care of their children. And if we provide basic child care for them, full day child care, near where they live or where they work, then they can work and earn more. So it's taken us several decades, but I definitely think now that there is a deeper understanding of this. I would say that even in the new education policy, it's a step forward that we're speaking now for the three plus children. But I would say that actually education and care and holistic development of children starts much earlier. It starts even before they're born, but even if we take from when they're born, the zero to three or zero to two 
years age group, which is often called the first thousand years of life, are absolutely critical. And that's the time when poor working women need full day childcare support the most. And we do, of course, have the integrated child development services. That scheme, ICDS, is being run by government of India. And that is a good backbone to, on which we can build further our child care services for the very young child. However, ICDS only uh, runs for about three to four hours. Some states like the southern states, Tamil Nadu, might be longer. But it still is not according to the hours of poor working women, the mass of whom, the majority of whom, 94% of whom are engaged in the informal economy. So really, this is a critical issue. And Govind, if I may say so, this COVID has brought it even more to light because all childcare centers were closed. Even Seva's own creches, which we run through our Sangini Childcare Cooperative, about which I'll speak later, even those had to close down because of the directive. And of course, it was just plain unsafe in the COVID times. Um, we're still in COVID times, and the ICDS centers have still not opened. We have chosen to open the pressures run by our Sangini Balseva Cooperative. But it's been very hard for women. Just let me give you a snapshot. A recent study which we've done together with the Institute of Social Sciences Trust brought out the fact that 99% of poor working families who were interviewed said that they had huge financial impact. Out of those, 85% of the women of those families said they were not able to get back to work. First of all, they lost their livelihoods. Those who had small jobs lost those jobs. But the biggest reason of all, they said, was that they are very busy with care work. So what has come through this pandemic is an understanding of the huge care economy uh, in, where women play a disproportionately large role elderly care, care of the sick, and obviously child care, especially of the very young child. They can't go back to work. And conversely, in our over 40 years of working on this issue, we've had done numerous studies through the years. And we have seen that if full day child care is provided according to the needs of poor working women, and indeed poor working people in general, women and men, the incomes of women go up by at least 50%, and very often they're more than double. So this is the situation. These right. facts are known. Right. So tell us about where we are in terms of our interventions today and what's changed in, let's say, the last decade um, and also maybe leading up to and onwards from the new education policy, uh, which of course has to play out uh, effectively uh, or it has to play out? So, as I said, you know, I think, first of all, conceptually, you know, it's always, a, as we say in Seva, a struggle of concept. I think now the concept of the importance or the criticality of early childhood care is now well understood. Six years are the absolute backbone of what happens to a child later on, not just in education, but holistic development, health, nutrition, education, cognitive development, emotional development, and so on. These things are now very well known. And I think they've also been well accepted by policymakers in our own country. Um, I remember some years ago when uh, education policies and the right to education was being debated Many of us in early childhood care were pushing hard that the right to education should go start much earlier, as I said, in the very early years of childhood. But that was not to be. We lost that struggle at that time. So it's good to see that now three pluses are incorporated in the new education policy. But I would argue that's not enough. We have to go much earlier. As I said, learning and education literally starts from the cradle. So that's where we right. are now. Yeah, please go ahead. Right. So, you know, the, the gap between the um, number of hours provided in terms of childcare uh, and what is ideal. So is, uh, is I can see about five to six hours. 
So how that's do we right. bridge that gap? Uh, that's one. And can it be done through policy or can it be done through policy and maybe more entrepreneurial responses? So what's your understanding and what more perhaps needs to be done? Sure, that's a very good question. And the short answer would be both. But let me elaborate. Um, Seva is leading along with Mobile Crash, Save the Children and others, a national campaign uh, for quality childcare for all. And one of our demands or requests of the, of the government, our own government, is A, they need to invest much more in early childhood care, up to 1% of GDP. B, as I said, there is all, already the backbone, the framework of ICDS. Build on that. Extend the hours of ICDS and have perhaps one more person assisting. I mean, not only is it good for children, it will also provide employment to local women. Um, and those children will grow and prosper, and so will their parents who will go out and earn more and bring in food and other essentials to the family. So what we're arguing is extension of ICDS. So this will not substantially increase the cost. Actually, the ICDS workers spend a lot of time in bookkeeping, record keeping, and so on. And so if you extend at least eight hour day, uh, obviously when many working people work more than eight hours, but at least eight hours, you must have full day holistic care. So that's one thing we've been saying to the government and state governments. Then we've been also saying that the experience in countries like ours is it's very difficult to run uh, these kind of centers in a proper way. The quality turn tends to be very mixed. So in some states, they run very well. In other states, it's very, very uh, poor quality. So what we've been saying is why not hand over the running of these centers to local women through their SSGs, self-help groups, self-help group federations, through cooperatives like the Seva promoted Sangini Bal Seva Cooperative, which will run it um, in a better way, but also with some extent, to some extent, a revenue model. Because actually we are arguing these children are not just the responsibility of their biological parents. These children are our children. They belong to all of society. And in our model of Sangini, what we've seen is that the cooperative runs well if parents pay, and in our case, parents pay 300 rupees per child per month. It's a contribution. The total costs are 1,000 rupees per child per month. It's not a huge amount to invest in the children of our country, I'm sure. But anyway, they pay fees. Then we also collect community contributions. So we find that in India, people are ready to give for food. There's the Annadan concept. And local people give, you know, some people give wheat, rice, oil, whatever. And then when their birthdays or some special feast days, um, the children get a special treat and so on and so forth. So you can mobilize in kind from the community. And then I think also the business community, our corporates, you know, who are resting on this vast informal economy. As I said, these are our children. And the least we can do is to give the children of our country a good start in life, to let them experience the joy of learning. So we're seeing it as a kind of confluence of different contributions from different sectors of society, kind of solidarity towards the working poor of this country. Right. And, and what's the, if I may call it the addressable market? I mean, in terms of, let's say, uh, you know, women, young, young mothers or younger mothers, children who are, let's say, under six, and how many of them at any point of time in your mind or your understanding need to be uh, covered under this, uh, under some form of childcare or the other? So the first comment I want to make is that for all working women, rich or poor, childcare is critical. Um, obviously, it's more of a life and death situation for poor working women because better off women can have nannies and other. There are now several early childhood centers and recently we had some discussions with them and I was amazed. Parents pay anywhere between 5,000 to 20,000 rupees a month. I mean, we cannot even imagine in the clientele that we work with this kind of uh, outlay. But, you know, more power to them, of course. So 
if we look at the informal economy i mean it's upwards of 400 million upward they usually the figure they give is 43 crore and if we take half of that that is the population of women and then obviously not all women are young mothers so you know we're talking about a couple of hundred million though at least you know conservative estimate i would say off the top of my head 100 to 150 million poor working women need this kind of support so that they can go out to work and earn and double their incomes. So this is an investment not only in the children of our country, this is an investment in the Indian economy. If half your population or even a quarter of your population is not able to go out and work, what does that do to our total economy? Imagine the economic forces that are unleashed if large numbers of women enter the workforce, which they very much want to do. So I think this needs to be enabled. And I think that there can be many models. Uh, you asked about the business model or revenue model. We believe it's possible. Uh, recently at a webinar, the head of the World Bank's early childhood, Amanda Devericelli, said that there are no examples anywhere in the world of childcare for low-income people being totally sustainable. That may be the case. But our experience is that poor parents are willing to put some money down. So I think government should allow that, uh, provided that it's not exploitative, provided that it, all the accounting is done properly. Uh, at a certain moment, we were running more than 100 ICDS centers, and we took permission from the Gujarat government. I must say they had great foresight at the time. And we said, we'll extend from your three to two to three hours, we'll do seven to eight hours. And then that extra hours, you allow us to take some fees from the parents to cover costs. And parents gave it right. happily and the government was fine with it. Right. So you said if the, the government should allow that. So is the government not allowing that? Uh, what's the policy stance on this? Well, I think, you know, no one has really thought it through. I mean, we had a tough time convincing our state government because they felt how will this work, you know, they're worried, and rightly so, that people may raise questions, public may raise questions, what's happening, isn't this what government is supposed to do, and so on. So ideal would be that the entire investment should be from the government, and then the add-on or the value added, the topping up can be done by the local community in cash or in kind. And by the way, we also find that people even give money. We've received ceiling fans, we've received all kinds of equipment and support. Because there are children, people give for children in this country. Right, so uh, the two points now. So one is, uh, you know, how do children themselves benefit? So we've looked at it from the mother's point of view and the fact that, as you said, uh, the number of hours that a mother could actually work and therefore the earning potential goes up dramatically. How do children from your un, uh, experience and uh, understanding benefit by getting this kind of institutional care in the early years? Oh, Govind, I wish I could take you to one of our crashes. They are such happy places. These children who have so little attention, so little exposure, so little um, exposure and, you know, they don't have toys, they don't have books. They don't have play materials like crayons and paper. They are happy spaces and these children just grow and bloom. We have both girls and boys and equally they start primary school. We find that 100% of our children go to the first standard. Um, and the teachers in the government schools and even the private schools, because some of our children under RTE get into that 25% for weaker sections of society. The reports that we get from teachers is they're delighted. They say we can really see the difference between children who've been through this early childhood education process and others who've not had the opportunity. They often thank us. And many of our children have, all of them go on to high school, but many of them have gone on to college. Some have become doctors, lawyers. Some of them now contribute to Sangini Cooperative's viability financial sustainability when they begin to earn because they say it was a life changer it was a game changer for them so their parents left them there in the creche early morning and came back in the evening and the creche teachers our bal sevikas were like their second mothers 
In fact, often on Sundays, they <laughs> pressurize their parents to take them to the Bal Seva Kendra, the center. Right. So, uh, let me ask you about the role of role of men folk, right? Right. So, that's another area I'm sure you've been looking at, and as must policy sure. uh, and those who frame policy. Have we have we come any distance in that regard, and uh, or uh, or if not, what more or how further do we have to go? So, I'm happy to report significant progress on this as well, at least as far as the Seva Cooperative is concerned. As a women's organization, perhaps, you know, we didn't reach out to men as much as we should have. But for the last 10 years, we have been actively reaching out. And every quarter, our fathers, the fathers of our children come to the center. They are actively engaged. They help in fundraising locally. They're very keen to monitor the progress and well-being of their children, everything from immunization to is my child learning ABC and numbers and, oh, they're very involved. I think, you know, times have changed, things have changed somewhat, I'm happy to report. You know, many people see on television, on their phones, uh, through the internet, the changes that are happening in other countries, how fathers are actively engaged in raising their children and getting a lot of joy out of it. It's not just a mere, the mere fact of taking the burden off women. There's that too, and that is important. And frankly, that was the reason we started reaching out to the fathers. And women said, you know, we just, we have no peace. We're working around the clock. Tell him to also uh, come in and help. Uh, but from that starting point, to see how engaged they are, how active they are, it's really heartening. And I think lots of lessons for all of us from there. Right. And, and your word of uh, uh, advice or, uh, yeah, I mean, or, or an appeal to those who want to or are consi could consider this as an entrepreneurial opportunity, uh, child, uh, early child care? So I think we are, for us, honestly, it's still a work in progress because our Sangini Bal Seva Cooperative has not achieved financial sustainability yet because I told you the clientele we are focused on are low income. One of the things we were experimenting with quite successfully before the pandemic was providing childcare through our experienced Bal Sevikas to formal sector settings who by a Supreme Court ruling uh, are required to provide childcare for their women staff. And we had a very good experience with the Reserve Bank of India in Ahmedabad. Uh, we had just 10 children in our in their crash, and we, they, we were asked to take care of them, run the whole system. And we were charging 10 times more, so 3,000 rupees per child. And the mothers were ready to go up to 5,000 rupees per child per month. So that kind of cross-subsidized the lower-income children, uh, some of the crashes. So that is, that's one way that, that we are thinking of. And, uh, but as I said, it's still a work in progress. So, you know, you can form a cooperative, you can form a company. A lot depends on what your thinking is. In our case, we are a workers' organization. So for us, a cooperative was, an, was a natural progression because it's also a membership-based organization, like a union, and one woman, one vote. Each woman has a share. And whatever small profits come are equally divided and so on. But you could just as soon form a company, and many people have. I think the challenge is how to focus on people who are earning less than two US dollars a day, somewhere in the range of 200 to 500 rupees a day, um, and still become financially sustainable. That's honestly a big question mark. And as I said, we are still on that journey. Right. Last question. So, uh, as you uh, look ahead, and you know, if, or someone uh, and and someone is watching this, uh, watches this, or reads this, uh, what what can they do? I mean, how can someone help uh, your effort, uh, either you specifically or the cause of really transforming young children's lives much before they actually reach even reach school? So, I think there are two levels. Um, of action and we very much appreciate solidarity not just from the communities where our 
pressures are embedded, but from all sectors of society, because as I said, these are our children, our collective responsibility. So first of all, you know, our cooperative does look for CSR and for donations and support. I mean, it's three lakhs per crash per year. And uh, that's not a huge amount of money uh, by any standards. And we need to open many, many more. Every day we get requests. So that's one level actually for the Sangini Cooperative or other organizations like ours. And the second level is you know, whether we can all join hands to say to our government that state government, central government, and even globally, I would say, to multilateral organizations like the World Bank, which are quite convinced, by the way, that this is actually a good investment. This is not expenditure. This is investing in a country's future, both investing in our children and also in their working parents, who anyway are making huge economic contributions. So it behooves all of us to join hands, to contribute in cash, in kind, uh, by you know, engaging in dialogue with our governments, by engaging in dialogue internationally, globally, to make sure that no child is left behind and that every child has an opportunity for early childhood care from birth itself. Right, uh, Mirai Chatterjee, Chairperson of the Seva Cooperative Federation. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, uh, my wishes on behalf of everyone who's going to watch this uh, for the work that you're doing. Thank you very much, Govin. I appreciate it. Thank you.